But now I want to shift from talking about uh, the current real honest to goodness World War III that we're you know starting to go through, or I should say the potential World War III, uh, and shift over to the World War III that I grew up with. For those that don't know, uh, that's the poster, a little modified by me, of the movie The Day After. Uh, the Day After was a movie that really, really got me in, uh, you know, I was 10 years old when this movie came out, and uh, we watched it as a family, and my father was uh, a flight engineer for the C-130s that at the time were uh, the backbone of the Takamo operation. Uh, and for those that don't know, Takamo uh, stood for, or still stands for, take charge and move out. And what these aircraft would do is they would fly in lazy circles in the sky waiting for the airborne command post to transmit orders to the nuclear submarines, to the ballistic missile submarines, the boomers, uh, that were you know, deep underwater. And in order to penetrate the water and get the message to the boomers, they would use very low frequency. Okay, that's great. Well, what does that mean? And, and what makes these aircraft special? Well, they would have a, a drogue basically pull an antenna out the back that would just extend forever and ever and ever, and then fly in tight circles so that that just dangled down, and that length of that antenna could now be used to transmit these VLF frequencies. Without that length of antenna, they couldn't, they couldn't send those signals, and they wouldn't be able to actually reach the, uh, the submarines. So... I grew up in a, in a family that was very attuned to the, the possibility of nuclear war. And so, so this, this TV show gave us a, you know, something that we could look at and process and talk through. Uh, and so that's really what we did. Uh, and the 10-year-old Alex was, uh, you know, uh, shaken by this, as, as you might imagine. If you haven't seen this movie, uh, it, it is a little dated. Um, but... I think it, a lot of it still holds up, but that could be nostalgia. Um, so you know, your mileage may vary. Uh, you can find it on YouTube. I don't think it's actually streaming anywhere else at this point. Um, and and I got to admit, I do. I actually watch this movie every couple of years to just kind of remind myself of of what it was like to watch it the first time and to remember uh, what we really were staring down in the 80s. And, you know, and from the 60s, you know, on, as soon as, as, soon as the first ballistic missiles were created, uh, this, this definitely was, uh, in the, at least in the back of, of everybody's mind. And I, and I find it interesting that, that even today, I feel like we are closer now than we ever were, uh, except for perhaps maybe the Cuban Missile Crisis. I know that there's... The Able Archer 83 was, was a pretty close call, but we didn't know about that. You know, the, the public didn't know, and so it wasn't until after the fact that we realized how close we got. Um, so as far as the public understanding of the dangers of nuclear war, I really feel like, you know, we're, we're definitely as, as close as we've ever been. Uh, and sometimes I wonder if, if people are treating it as seriously as, as all that. Um, but anyhow, just to, to kind of talk about the, the day after. Um, and, and I thought, you know, actually, I've grown up with, uh, with apocalyptic movies. And in fact, uh, years before the day after, I actually saw uh, my first real post-apocalyptic movie or apocalyptic movie. Uh, and that was Charlton Heston's The Omega Man. This was playing one Saturday afternoon, Saturday morning on the Far East Network. Uh, when I was a little kid living in the Philippines. So you figure I'm in like second or third grade and I'm watching Heston, you know, machine gun down these weird disco vampire things. I loved that movie so hard. Uh, and I still do. I still do. Again, you know, it's one of those movies I can watch this movie at any time. I love it so much. Um, so I just thought, you know what, I really dig these movies. Um, I'm currently working on a series that is a... Uh, you know, a, a third world war that starts in 1980. Um, so, you know, going and talking about these movies and, and looking at them, I almost consider it research uh, for, for what I'm working on. Uh, so hopefully you guys will find this interesting. Um, you know, let me know in the comments uh, or tell me to shut up and go back to talking about Ukraine. Tell me to, to, you know, shut the channel down and call it a day. 
um, you know, I, I know I've got some some fans and I've got some anti fans out there. So uh, I take what what do I care? You know, I'll listen to y'all. But I thought that I would talk about uh, the day after, maybe give it a rundown, talk a little bit about uh, sort of common themes that we see in these World War III movies. Um, the geopolitical situation that, that starts off the, the world, or starts off the film. Um, then talk a little bit about the war in narrative. So how are they explaining the war? How do they, uh, how do they progress uh, for, through the escalation that ultimately leads to uh, World War III? Uh, then talk about the war in visual effects. I think this is really fun because you know, this was not just uh, 1983, but this was 1983 on television. So um, that's, that's a little crazy to think about how far we've come. You know, Netflix right now could do 800 times better than anything that they could do in the, uh, in the 80s. But with practical effects and with a little creativity and imagination, um, you know, we'll see what they came up with. And then there's the aftermath. You know, what happens after, after the war itself? Most of these movies, not all, will we'll get into the uh, aftermath. And then the last thing that I really want to talk about are the tropes. Um, the tropes make these movies, if you ask me. Uh, some of them are so cheesy, but they're always there. And it's, it's like the, the filmmakers knew they had to put it in there because people were expecting it. So... So that, that's kind of the format that I'd like to take, and, and we can tweak this as we go if we decide that, that maybe, you know, some of this never happens or uh, it's not that interesting. We'll see. Um, but in this case, with the day after, let's start with the, uh, the geopolitical situation. So the day after does not take long to get from a geopolitical situation to it's a war. In fact, the only real comment on the geopolitical situation is that the Soviets have decided to blockade Berlin. Now, if you're reading my books, you probably know uh, that, that Berlin in the Cold War was smack dab in the middle of East Germany. So if you look at this map, the, uh, the light green island that's surrounded by dark green that's all, uh, that, that's Berlin. In fact, that's West Berlin. And then everything around it is East Germany. So Berlin, being behind or deep in, in East Germany, had a section of it that was controlled by the West, and that was West Berlin. But the, the Russians, the Soviets at the time, uh, they really wanted control of all of Berlin. And, you know, just geographically, why not? Obviously, politically, it's charged, and this all comes from the fallout of the Second World War when French, British, American, and uh, Soviet forces occupied all of Germany and then occupied all of Berlin. And the Soviets basically kept theirs, whereas Germany, I'm sorry, France, England, and the United States returned theirs to what became West Germany. So this creates a situation where there's a population in, German, in, in Berlin that, that could easily be cut off by Soviet forces. In fact, in 1948, they did exactly that. They blockaded the, the city, and the only way that the West was able to survive was through what we call the Berlin Airlift, where we essentially overflew East German airspace so that we could drop supplies into West Berlin. So... Um, so this was not unheard of, and this was definitely one of the possible trigger points uh, for a uh, NATO versus Warsaw Pact clash. But that was it. Th once, once that was done, uh, the Americans decided that, or I should say NATO, decided that that was unacceptable, and so they, they went ahead and invaded into East Germany with the intention of relieving their forces in West, Ger in West Berlin. So... All the forces, the French, the Germans, the Americans, we all had military forces. We had civilian populations that were in West Berlin. And so in order to relieve them, to get them you know, out of West Berlin, the uh, NATO crossed into East Germany and, and with a, essentially you know, an armored thrust, they crossed the, the Helmstedt, Marienborn, and man, I probably butchered that, 
uh, border crossing, which is essentially uh, the most direct route from West Germany to East Berlin. So that's not good. Um, that, that's basically the beginning of World War III. That is, you know, in, in, today's, in today's parlance, you know, that's, that's Russia invading Poland. That, that basically is the trigger point. Um, so we don't get a lot of updates about the day-to-day -day because most of this movie is, is still giving, getting us introduced to the characters. Um, you'll find with a lot of these World War, II, or World War III movies, uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on the characters. Uh, they're mostly all walking tropes. Uh, it's not, not always the case. Uh, but these are definitely plot-driven films. But we did get a kind of a goofy scene where there's a newscaster in the background who's talking about how uh, in the early part of the war, a Soviet MiG-25 flies, uh, flies into West German airspace uh, and attacks uh, uh, supplies on, uh, on, on West German soil. So they hit a depot on West German soil. Uh, and, and that's goofy because... The MiG-25 never had any kind of air-to-ground uh, capability. They were strictly interceptors uh, and reconnaissance planes. So, uh, obviously, uh, the powers that be making the movie knew that that nobody, uh, not not too many people watching the movie, were going to really care about that. But it's the kind of thing that really stands out to a nerd like me. Um, okay, so the next step: the the Russians evacuate Moscow. So we got the, the armored thrust comes in to East Germany. There's uh, some skirmishing going along the east-west border. Uh, then, then the next thing you know, the Russians evacuate Moscow. And this is meant to kind of show that escalation. Okay, the Russians are seriously thinking about this thing going, you know, chain reaction, out of control, everybody dies. But I do think it's kind of funny because the one city that might not evacuate during a nuclear war like this might be Moscow. Uh, at the time, Moscow was the only city in the world that was protected, actively protected, by an anti-ballistic missile system. Now, I wouldn't put too much faith in its uh, ability to, to actually thwart a nuclear attack, uh, but that, uh, I believe the NATO codename was Galosh, they, uh, that system would basically fire nuclear warheads into the atmosphere to detonate the incoming warheads uh, before they could actually get close enough to, to cause significant and superior harm. In fact, the United States had a similar system that was, uh, that was based, I think, on the, on the Nike Ajax platform. But uh, by the time 1983 rolled around, uh, we had basically abandoned the concept. Um, so, so there is that. Uh, so, okay, they, they, ask, they evacuate Moscow, uh, and the next thing that happens is what, uh, you know, every one of us kids, uh, Cold War kids, knew was going to come, and that is the Soviets come pouring through the Folda Gap. Uh, for anybody that doesn't know, uh, we figured, the strategists understood that just based on the geography of Germany, there were going to be two main armored thrusts coming from the Soviet uh, territory, the, the Eastern Bloc, into NATO territory, and, and one would be the, the North German Plains, and that would be met by uh, the Northern Army Group, which was made up of the British, the Netherlands, uh, the Germans, and, uh, and I believe the French were up there. And then the other attack would come through what was known as the Folda Gap, because it was literally the best place to conduct armored operations. You know, it was the best terrain for it. Uh, and so even if you were, were completely giving up surprise, the tactical advantages of just being able to move quickly uh, more than offset the, the lack of, of relevant surprise. So, so that was the next escalation, and then things get a little foggy. There's this interesting throwaway line in the background of a uh, rumor that a low-yield nuke has been detonated just outside of Frankfurt. And we're, we're talking like two days into the war. And one, it's interesting because they never really follow up on this. And so, you know, fog of war, are they just letting us know that nobody knows what's going on? Uh, because we're talking about, this is like two days into the war, and even the most optimistic plans uh, that the Soviets had you know, still called for a week to get, you know, to, to the Rhine, you know, seven days to the Rhine. 
they called it. And so, so that, that was interesting to me because, you know, again, did the writers just throw that out there or was that, you know, was that intentional? Hard, hard to say. Um, but, but, you know, it doesn't lead to anything. So, so it makes me believe that it's just this, you know, uh, fog of war, unconfirmed report didn't really happen. You know, we, we were getting some of that in, in the Ukraine uh, conflict because there would be these massive explosions of like uh, a fuel or an ammo depot going off and, and people were, you know, starting to go, Hey, wait a second. You know, is that, is that, you know, more than, than just a regular explosion? And no, it's not. But that's, that's kind of how I can see a, a confused report like that coming out. Uh, the, next, the next escalation is another one that's kind of like the MiG-25 uh, dropping bombs, confuses me. And that is, there's a naval engagement in the Persian Gulf. And, and that one kind of confuses me because I feel like there, there's not a lot of good reasons for the Soviets to be hanging out in the Persian Gulf at the time. Um, sure, it's possible, but um, it would just make more sense to me if this conflict had happened, you know, in the North Sea or somewhere a little closer to, to the European conflict. And part of me thinks that they threw this one out there because essentially the Americans know where the Persian Gulf is. You know, we had the Gulf War going on, not the Gulf War, but the uh, tanker war going on. Uh, so it was, in our, it was in the news a lot. So... Uh, I think that's probably why they did that, just to give us a little bit more of a grounding. Um, so the next thing that happens after that is definitely what was called for in doctrine, uh, and that was the NATO use of tactical nuclear weapons to stop the Soviet armored assault. Um, so they essentially nuked them just as they came through, um, to stop them from getting to, to Frankfurt. And that's pretty much the end of the, the, the conventional war. The, you know, once the, once the nukes start going off, it immediately escalates. They, the first thing that happens is the Russians nuke the uh, NATO headquarters in Brussels. So, gone. Okay. Um, and then we get reports, and, and these crop up a lot in these movies. Uh, Beale Air Force Base gets wiped out, and that's important because that's a, a radar tracking station uh, to help us uh, track incoming ballistic missiles. So uh, that's going to definitely be one of the first things that gets taken out uh, if they're going to do a, a mass attack. Uh, and sure enough, uh, the next thing we know, it is, it is the most iconic... TV scene of the 80s. It was what that poster is. It's a woman. It's, it's actually not just this one woman. It's, it's many, many characters are just standing out there watching the open fields as the, the missiles are leaving the silos and going into the air. Uh, and, and that's when you know that it's, that it's you know, it's gone. It's, it's over. Um, you know, it cannot escalate anymore. Uh, now, that there's, there's a little fibbing there because, yeah, it could have been a, a partial launch. And, in fact, I think we'll see, you know, when we get to the aftermath that, that clearly this wasn't a, a complete and total annihilation. But, uh, but no, that, that really gets us to, uh, to the end of, of the war in narrative. Um, after that, it's just, uh, you know, the detonations of the nuclear weapons. And then, you know, we're moving on into the aftermath. So, the war in, in uh, visual effects. I really, I think that this still holds up, but like I said at the beginning, it could just be me being nostalgic. Um, they did a really good job with the airburst. So, when they're, they do an airburst over Kansas City, and they start with a, with a scene of the skyline framed pretty well in the, in the camera, but then it pans out, and you're like, oh, okay, well, it's a little further away from the city. And then it pans out again, and you're like, oh, okay, well, they're a little further away from the city. You know, the city is now getting smaller. And then they pan out again, and then there's an, you can see the flash of the airburst above it. And it just gives you this, this awesome understanding of, oh, my God, that was huge. And I think that that, that camera work where they're just that, that jarring, you know, move 
that absolutely makes uh, you know makes it so much more significant, so much more impactful. Um, next, you have a ton of B-roll. Uh, every time there was a, a major blast wave test that was available in the National Archives, I think, they dusted it off and, and put it in here. You'll see some of your old favorites. You'll see farmhouses collapsing, warehouses, uh, you know, being blown over. Um, and, and, hey, 1983 TV movie, you, I get it. I absolutely get it. But the one that got us 10-year-olds talking was this effect where you would get the flash and then it would essentially x-ray the people. So you would see their bones and then gone <laughs> and vaporized. And that was just, it just drove the point home. You know, it was really drawing up that fear of radiation that, you know, what are we really dealing with? Um, you know, my God, what is this going to mean, you know, when this is all said and done? And, uh, and so, you know, again, I think they, for, with what they had to work with, I think they did a great job. Um, and, and I still think it holds up, but I, I'd ask maybe, uh, maybe some of the millennials or Gen, Gen Z to tell me I'm, tell me I'm just uh, being an old man. Um, but, but no, that, that was the war in, in visual effects. Uh, the next thing we have is the aftermath. Um, and it's brutal. It is as brutal as you would as you would expect it to be. Um, I know my British friends are all thinking about uh, the movie Threads, and, and maybe we'll talk about that in a future uh, video. But uh, you know the the land is is absolutely destroyed. We have uh, uh, Billy McCoy is an airman who was uh, maintenance on one of the one of the missile silos, and he, we see the post. Uh, you know, explosion, post-devastation world through his eyes, largely, um, because he didn't have shelter. He wasn't protected uh, anywhere. Um, and so he's basically on foot trying to, you know, get back to his family. They're dead. Um, trying to find a place to go, find a place to be. And, uh, and, and so, yeah, you know, you get uh, a lot of um, ashing, you know, floating around in the in the sky, uh, darkness because of all that you know debris in the air, um, and and you know that this was a time when nuclear winter was really being bandied about as as a major you know cost of a nuclear exchange, and so I feel like even though you know nuclear winter is more of a bigger picture issue, I felt like they were kind of trying to. Uh, kind of trying to allude to that with some of the some of the way they they shot the the post explosion the post detonation world. Um, where there was optimism uh, in this film was the survivors, and there were quite a few survivors, but they were basically trying to put a government back together again uh, in the aftermath, and so there were scenes where uh, there's a, there, and remember, okay, actually, I, since we didn't really talk about the characters, uh, one of the characters is a, uh, a farming community. It's a, a farmer, his uh, two daughters, and his wife. And after, after the war, you know, the, after the, uh, the exchange, after they crawl out of their, their shelters and, and dust themselves off, they're meeting up with the other farmers, and there's a, there's, one poor guy who <laughs> was the, the federal government's agent in the area who's trying to explain to everybody that, okay, so in order to grow crops, and we need to grow crops now, uh, we need to scrape away the top six inches of your topsoil. <laughs> it's like, okay, what are you going to do with that? You're going to have six inches of dirt. How many acres of farmland do I have? And you know what's under that six inches isn't exactly good for growing a lot. So... Um, but they're 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 giving it a shot, you know. They're, they're trying to make it happen, um, and and it, we don't we don't go on very far to see what happens, um, you know, down the road. And and again, I'll defer to my British friends uh, and their film Threads, uh, which which does extend. It just keeps going, man. Um, that is that is like the longest fingernail down the chalkboard, uh, you know, end of a movie. Uh, don't get me wrong, I love it, but uh, it's a, it is a painful watch. Uh, and we were spared that in, in the day after. 
Um, though they do actually say in the end, they're like, oh, hey, by the way, also, this is very optimistic. If there's really a nuclear exchange, it's going to be way worse. Um, so very sobering ending to that movie. Um, but not to get too serious, we've got to roll back and we've got to talk about the tropes. All right. I talked about Billy McCoy. And he, uh, again, he's an airman. He does maintenance on the missile base. So as this scene is un unfolding, the Germans are, are uh, or I'm sorry, the Soviets are occupying or blockading Germany. Sorry, the Soviets are blockading West Berlin. Uh, well, the, the missile base goes on alert, and uh, Airman McCoy has to go to the alert, and his wife is giving him so much static about the fact that he has to go on this alert. And, and yet, you know they've had this conversation a hundred times. Um, just, ah, I can't help it, I gotta go. And, and, and yeah, that, that, it, that shows up in, in so many of these movies. Um, another one that I really liked was a gratuitous football scene. So one of the characters is a doctor in, uh, in Lawrence, Kansas, over at the uh, University of Kansas. And there is a scene where, for literally no reason but America, he stops by his son's football practice to watch him catch a few passes and, and talk to a fellow who's the, the, the father of one of the other players. And it's never mentioned before. It's never foreshadowed at all. It's never talked about again. It was just a reminder that this is this is uh, America and, and and you know solid America too you know not that not that elitist coastal stuff no this is this is God fear in uh, the Midwest so uh, panic buying at the grocery store I think they did a really good job on that scene um, you know as soon as everybody realizes that they need two weeks worth of food they're all going to try and get it at the same time I mean we lived it with the <laughs> With the great toilet paper shortage of 2020, um, you know, we, we know what panic buying looks like, but that wasn't even just, that wasn't even for survival uh, like this. So, so that's pretty, uh, that's, 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 that's pretty good. Um, okay. Uh, the next one is uh, Mrs. Dahlberg. The Dahlbergs are the farmers, and so this is the farmer's wife. Uh, the world is falling apart around her, but she has a wedding the next day. Her daughter, one of her, her eldest daughter is getting married, and so she just doesn't have time for nuclear war. Uh, her, she has dinner for 70 people coming up tomorrow, and there is just no way that she has time to, to take shelter. And so she has to basically be carried down the, uh, the stairs, you know, fighting it the whole way. And, and again, you know, it's very common in these movies, the, the amount of denial. Uh, and I, I sometimes wonder about that, you know, would people really fight the reality of it? And, you know, the more I think about it, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I think that there are definitely people that for something like this, it just couldn't be real um, or they, they couldn't let it be real. So, so I think that's, a, that, that's definitely a fascinating aspect of these movies. Um, and then the last trope is uh, the Denise Dahlberg, the girl that was getting married. Uh, after maybe a week in the uh, in the shelter, uh, she just gets cabin fever and loses it and runs out, and uh, and she gets eh, rescued is kind of the wrong word, uh, but she is uh, she is brought back into the shelter uh, by everybody's favorite actor, Steve Gutenberg. Um, this was one of his early roles. I think this was before he was Carrie Mahoney in Police Academy, um, for which he probably should have gotten an Academy Award. But uh, this, was, uh, this was, I think, my first exposure to, uh, to Steve Gutenberg. Um, but yeah, I think that, that cabin fever in, the, in these situations has absolutely got to be, um, got to be real. Uh, you know, how, how can you go from having your normal life to life is now confined within this storm cellar for two weeks uh, without, without having some kind of uh, real mental challenges and, and somebody's going to succumb to that. Uh, so hopefully it's not you, hopefully it's not your family. Hopefully we're not taking cover in, uh, in fallout shelters anytime soon. Uh, let's see, so the only other thing I wanna talk about, uh, a couple of lines they had uh, in the movie that were pretty good. Uh, and, and these kind of stood out because they do remind me a little bit about what's going on uh, in Ukraine today. 
And the first one was a, a talking head on the news is saying that the United States won't sacrifice Chicago for Hamburg. Basically, the idea was, even if the Russians invade, we're not gonna we're not gonna nuke the Russians because you know we're not gonna sacrifice uh, you know any of our cities just to save Hamburg. And that gets bandied about a bit in the today's situation. The idea that we're not going to exchange Chicago for Kiev, and I think there's a real jump between the two, though, because in this case, Hamburg was, you know, part of a NATO ally, uh, and so we were, you know, treaty treaty obligated to to defend Hamburg. And what does that mean as far as the use of nuclear weapons? Uh, you know, that is that is kind of up in the air. Uh, but the difference is we, we, we just don't have that kind of commitment to Kiev. And I know a lot of people get mad at me when I, when I point that out. Um, and, and, you know, they say, well, you know, where's the line? And, and I always say the line is NATO. Um, and that's always been the line. And, and as long as we make sure that everybody understands that that's the line, then we shouldn't have to be talking about, uh, you know, an exchange like that. Uh, another one was uh, when a girl in, uh, one of the girls in the University of Kansas was uh, in a debate and she didn't think that it was going to go down. She didn't think that the fight was going to happen because uh, she said, uh, quote, look, did we help the Czechs, the Hungarians, the Afghans, or the Poles? We're not going to nuke the Russians to save the Germans. And again, it gets to that point that, well, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Afghanistan, and Poland, none of those were NATO countries. And so, you know, it's this, this fundamental misunderstanding of what it means to be in a defensive alliance like that, uh, you know, and that, that literally is the advantage. So, so all in all, I just, I, I really love this movie. Um, it's a big slice of Americana. It's, uh, it's a big part of my childhood. Uh, and, I, and I hope you guys, uh, you know, if you haven't seen this film, I've ruined it for you completely. You probably don't have to see it, but you should still do yourself a favor and watch it. If you have seen it and you liked it, hey, I recommend look it up on YouTube. You know, give it a watch again, and and you know, let me know if you think it holds up. Uh, and with all that said, if you made it this far, I really appreciate it. You know, I'm having a lot of fun. I'm learning a lot uh, of this uh, of this video production stuff, uh, and so I hope you stick around. And and I'll chat at you hopefully next Tuesday. Thanks a lot.